The whole thing was Ray's idea. Yes, I had a hand in it, but I swear I had no idea what his plans were. Hell, I'm not even sure if he even knew, to be honest. I had a hard time making out his words at first because he was just so excited to the point of barely being able to form a legible sentence. The main thing I got from the phone call was to get to his house as soon as possible. He's usually a pretty composed guy, but something had him riled up, something serious. We'd been friends since we were kids, ever since I helped him with a burgeoning bully problem in the sixth grade. Ray was really shy and quite small for his age, so the bigger kids would lay into him pretty good. I didn't know anything about him at the time, but he always sat alone at lunch. When Ronnie Blige and his goons started harassing him one day, I couldn't let that shit slide. I wasn't especially strong or outgoing myself, but I could never stomach the bigger kids hassling the smaller ones. As soon as they swatted his lunch off the table and pushed him to the ground from his chair, I ran over before taking the time to consider my actions. Now, I'm not going to lie, I got my ass handed to me, but I stood my ground until Mr. Morris stepped in. He was the social studies teacher and was about as intimidating as a half-flattened grasshopper, but he was still an authority figure. I ended up suspended along with Ronnie and his friends, but it was enough to make them think twice about pushing Ray around anymore. After all, I did get a couple of good swings in on him. When I got back to school the following week, Ray couldn't thank me enough for stepping in when I did. We became pretty tight from then on. Jess was Ray's sister, and I developed a crush on her soon after my friend introduced us. Out of respect for my friend, I never acted on my feelings, but the friend zone knocked me out of the running anyway. The three of us spent a lot of time together over the high school years, and we managed to hold on to that friendship after they left for college. I never went to university myself, and... I was never the best student, due in part to my fairly erratic life at home. I won't go into specifics, but my parents' relationship was always rocky at best. Of course, I wasn't exactly the sharpest tool in the shed either. When we learned the national anthem back in kindergarten, I wondered what Don's early light was. Of course, I didn't ask anyone. Nope, I just assumed it meant really bright and started using that shit in sentences. Wow, the sun sure is Don's early today. Can I close the curtains? It's way too Don's early outside. <laughs> Don't call me stupid. I'm Don's earlier than you. Yeah, I was about as Don's early as a cave in the middle of a moonless night. Though I wasn't particularly smart, I was always pretty mechanically inclined, so I ended up working at a garage after school. Working on vehicles paid well enough for me to get in my own place, as far away from my folks and carve out a decent life for myself. Ray dropped out of college after a couple years, while Jess worked on her law degree for many years after. She always did like to argue. He was always quite the intellectual, but he claimed that school was just attempting to dumb him down. Were it anyone else who claimed that, I would have thought them way too arrogant for their own good. But not Ray. As soon as I pulled into the driveway, the garage door opened with my friend standing behind it. His house was nothing especially big or fancy, but it sat alone on a wide open area with a long road that led directly to the huge carport that's the next to the house. This is going to be the big one, brother, he said as he ran up to my car before I even had the chance to get out. What's going to be the big what? I asked, chuckling at his childlike enthusiasm. Two words, he began to say before being cut off by his sister pulling into the wide driveway. Jess was with her husband Elijah, who was riding shotgun. He was a pretty good guy, but I can't say I didn't hold just the slightest bit of jealous contempt for him. I'm fairly sure he knew how I felt about his wife, but he was cool enough to let it slide. Ray walked toward his sister and pulled her into a hug as soon as she got out of the car. He smiled at Eli and gave him an acknowledging nod, to which his brother-in-law returned the gesture. He waited for us to follow him into the garage, where he had already had some fairly professional-looking blueprints spread across his work table. You're not serious, Jess exclaimed after glancing down at the prints. I worked it all out last night, Ray replied with glee in his eyes. Okay, you've officially watched entirely too much Rick and Morty, I said, laughing out loud after I looked at the mapped out sketch of what was labeled 
portal gun. Eli laughed with me while Jess appeared to be trying her best to keep her composure. Look, I know it sounds crazy, but I swear to Christ it'll work, Ray said, looking between us. His voice sounded a bit pitiful, and we had clearly hurt his feelings. Just trust me, guys, he pleaded. I'll make sure we're all partners in this. Just have faith in me. Ray, you're my closest friend, I said. You know I've always got your back, but this is science fiction, not actual science. To call my friend a genius would be dramatically underselling his intellect. Though I had endless faith in his brilliant mind, I just couldn't wrap my far more simple mind around it. After dropping out of college, Ray started working on a variety of entrepreneurial ventures. I can't necessarily speak to what said work involved, since it is above my pay grade and my understanding. By the time he was 25, he had several patents and was worth more than $20 million. That's with only two years of college. For him to call this ridiculous idea the big one, I couldn't help but wonder what he considered big. This is exactly what motivated my next question. Are you sure you want to risk your reputation on something like this? I asked. He seemed to consider what I said for a moment. He was generally very quick-witted and rarely lost for words. Well, with us, anyway. Even with all his success, he was almost painfully shy and introverted. I was usually the one he would confide in, which made this whole ordeal even more shocking. He was always close with his sister, and he even took to Eli pretty quickly. He tried to share his wealth with all of us, but Jess was already a very successful lawyer, and I was just too hard-headed to accept any form of charity. I did allow him to invest in my own garage, though. I couldn't rationalize just taking his money as a handout, but he was happy to be a partner in my maintenance shop. This isn't about money, Ray said, breaking the silence that had begun to consume his garage. He looked at each of us, his eyes wide. There was a strange sort of desperation in his face that I'd never seen before. Nothing I have ever done has left a mark on this world, he continued. This, he said, patting his hand on the blueprint, is my legacy. This could change the world as we know it. My mind was made up before I looked at Jess and Eli for confirmation. I still thought this was completely nuts, but I had always had my friends back. I wouldn't change that now, even if I thought his genius was giving way to a touch of madness. Okay, I said, giving him a half smile. What do you need me to do? Ray lit up like a kid on Christmas morning. While Eli and Jess nodded their acceptance of whatever this plan had held for them. Though mine would be the hand that would assemble this thing according to my friend's instructions, I was unsure what roles Jess and Eli would play. For the most part, they had little to no involvement. I assumed Ray just invited them to be part of it since they were part of our small circle of friends and family. The design was far simpler than I could ever have thought, but my friend had absolutely no doubt it would work. Some parts took time to get our hands on, and others cost Ray an insane amount of money. He claimed he didn't care about the financial aspects, but I wasn't entirely sure I bought that. Still, I couldn't believe how much he was willing to pay for this ridiculous venture. I'd never seen him so blindly driven before. Honestly, he scared the hell out of me sometimes. My friend had always been a calm and composed individual, but he completely lost his shit at times during this process. I'd never seen this side of him before, and I even began to fear for his sanity. There were several times during those first few months where he would throw parts across the room or pound on the work table until his knuckles bled. There was something in his eyes at those times that caused me to feel very uncomfortable. He was like a man possessed, more so than one driven by a goal. 
After three months, we finally had our first finished attempt. After three months, we finally had our first attempt finished. When Ray aimed it at the wall and pulled the trigger, it did little more than lightly scorch the wood. He flipped out. He screamed at the top of his lungs and launched the gun at the concrete floor. He stomped his foot on it, still yelling and swearing so much that his words didn't even sound like any form of recognizable language anymore. He proceeded to beat and kick everything in sight. He punched the wall until the wood splintered from his blows. As soon as this legendary tantrum started, I got the hell out of there. I just walked around to the back of his house and lit up a cigarette while he tore the garage apart. After a while, his guttural bellows didn't cause me to wince anymore, but it was probably a solid hour before he calmed down. What the hell was that, man? I asked when Ray finally walked out of the demolished garage. I'm sorry, he replied, staring at the ground to avoid eye contact. I've just... I just put so much money into this, he continued. I can't fail. Maybe you should just walk away from it for a bit, I suggested. No, he screamed out as soon as the words left my mouth. Whoa, now, I said, backing away from my friend. I'm sorry, Ray said. I just, I mean, they won't. I can't stop now. They won't? I asked, who are they? Ray continued to stutter, but he wouldn't give me a straight answer. He told me he was not feeling very rational at the moment and not to listen to any of his crazy words. I finally got him settled down, and he agreed to take a few days off to clear his head. I was trying to get him to just drop this whole thing, but he wouldn't hear it. We didn't talk for a couple weeks after that day. It was probably the longest I'd ever gone without talking to him, but he'd freaked me out quite a bit. I had gone back to my regular schedule and resigned myself to just wash my hands of this whole ordeal. I felt bad for ditching out on my friend, but I wasn't going to take part in his descent into madness anymore. Just after two weeks after his meltdown, Ray contacted me again. He apologized for the way he'd acted and practically begged me to come back and help him. I worked it out, he said in a trembling voice. I couldn't tell if he was just nervous about making his apology or if he was getting himself worked up again. After we talked for a while longer, I agreed to give him one last chance. I can't say I was excited about the prospect of taking part in this endeavor further, but he was my friend. After another two months, Ray's portal gun was ready to be tested again. My body was shaking as he aimed the gun at the wall of his garage again. My heart was racing. The device was simple in its design. It was almost shaped like a hairdryer, and it had cables that ran to the heavy backpack. Made me think of a bad cosplay attempt at a Ghostbusters proton pack. There were blinking lights and a couple of switches on the pack, while the gun itself had two knobs and a trigger. One knob was to adjust the diameter of the portal, while the other was to switch between entry and exit points. The toggles on the back were just to power up and activate the thing, and I'm pretty sure the LEDs were just there for show. My friend asked me to flip the switches while he aimed the gun at the wall. Here goes nothing, he said, his eyes wide, manic. As soon as he pulled back the trigger, a small glowing circle of orange light appeared on the wall. He turned the first knob, and the light widened before my eyes. After he let off the trigger, the circle of light changed to a perfectly round hole in the wall. He then turned the second knob and aimed at the opposing wall, leaving another equally round hole. There was nothing special about how the openings looked. 
It wasn't exactly an enter here indicator, but Ray expected that. He told me just to be sure I kept track of which portal came first. My friend grabbed a basketball from a box to the side of the workbench. He gave me a strange look with a crooked half-smile before he tossed the ball through the first hole. Sure enough, as soon as the ball went through the left wall, it came bouncing out of the right. Holy shit, I said in a monotone voice as shock would allow me no more than that. After closely examining the basketball, Ray gave me a wink and ran toward the first hole. No, wait! I yelled out, but he was running back through the right wall before I could even suggest that we run a few more tests first. He yelled out in a frantic and excited shriek after he arrived back on the other side of the room. We both laughed quite a lot when he thrust his arm to the left side and it popped right out of the opposing wall. You really did it, I said with a surprised smile. <laughs> we did it. Ray replied with glassy eyes. He asked me to call his sister and ask her to come by. While we waited for her arrival, we conducted a few more tests. I tossed the basketball at the exit portal to see what would happen. Somehow, it couldn't even go through it. It just bounced back at us. We lobbed a variety of things through the origin hole, though we didn't need to prove that it worked anymore. Honestly, we just had fun watching them go from one and pop out of the other. After a while, Ray flipped the backpack switches and both walls returned to their previous state. Still, in complete disbelief, I smacked my hands against both walls to find them completely sealed and solid. It would still be a few hours before Jess arrived, so my friend and I just kicked back and celebrated our success with a couple of cigars he bought for this very occasion. He wanted to hold off on the champagne until his sister arrived, but we still cracked open a couple of beers and clinked them together before chugging down the deliciously cold brew. It was getting dark when Jess and Eli finally pulled into the driveway. They didn't seem overly amused about coming out here, but they changed their tune after we gave them a demonstration of our accomplishment. They both just stared on with wide eyes and slack jaws as Ray strolled through one wall and out the other. They were at a complete loss for words until we popped open the champagne and passed around glasses. I can't believe you actually pulled it off, Eli said, barely aware of the drink in his hand. I always knew you'd change the world, little brother, Jess said with a wide smile. Ray was wearing a proud look on his face as he admired his own work. If it's like they say, you ain't seen nothing yet he remarked, halfway to himself. That's the second time you've mentioned they. Who the hell are they, actually? I asked. Huh? My friend replied, seemingly pulled from his own thoughts. Oh, uh, figure of speech, he continued dismissively. I studied his face for a moment. He didn't look like himself at the moment. His eyes were somewhat manic again, and his lower lip appeared to be twitching. Are you okay, man? Mm-hmm, he replied, not taking his eyes from the portal gun that lay on the table. After a few minutes of an incredibly awkward silence that had encompassed the room, Ray reached out and flipped the switches back to the on position. He slung the pack across his back and clutched the gun in his hand. He turned to meet Eli's curious stare. Do you trust me? He asked. His whole body looked as though it was shivering slightly. I had no idea what had gotten into him all of a sudden. I'd assisted him on a number of projects over the years, from juicing up the turbo on his Mustang to helping him convert a simple and cheap drone into something with an incredibly long range. He had so many projects over the years, I couldn't even guess how many different ideas he had, but I'd never seen him like this. Eli looked at his wife and then over at me. He seemed uncertain and appeared to be looking for confirmation that he should indeed trust his brother-in-law. Jess just 
shrugged, but I shook my head. I wouldn't even trust my friend with how he was acting right now. I, uh, I guess, he said, sounding very unsure whether this was the best response at the moment. Without another word, Ray quickly switched the gun's knob to the exit position. His expression grew even wilder when he held it outstretched in front of him, aiming the barrel at Eli's midsection. What are you doing, man? Eli said, backing away from Ray. This is going to blow your mind, my friend said in a voice that had grown high-pitched and frantic. Ray, stop! I yelled, but he pulled the trigger before I could attempt to stop him. Jessica screamed out in terror as her husband's eyes went wide and blank. I just stared in shock as the portal appeared to wrap around the center of his body that left the upper and lower sections detached, held in place by the opening that glowed with a vibrant green light. I did not see the room behind Eli through the hole, but what looked to be a completely alien landscape, with the neon-like hues emitting from the void, it almost resembled gazing through night vision goggles. Jess tried to run to her husband, but I grabbed her arm and held her back. She beat on my chest while screaming out, What did you do to him? She yelled as much to me as her brother. I I don't know, I stuttered, completely lost for words. I, I don't know what this is. I needed her to know that I was not part of whatever the hell this was, but I was in complete horrified shock myself. Ray let the gun drop to the ground beside him, and he held his arms outstretched to his sides as something began to appear from within the portal in Eli's torso. Jesus Christ, I said, as I watched two thin skeletal arms reach out and grip onto Eli's chest and upper thigh with six-finger elongated hands. As the creature forced its way, out of Jessica's husband. The pressure from its limbs bent Eliza's chest and legs backwards into a terrifying sort of reversed sitting position. He appeared to float in midair while the portal held the two halves of him together, though I heard bones snap and tissue tear as a screeching face worked its way out of the hole. The head looked like a deformed human skull with greenish-gray skin tightly wrapped around it. The face split in the center to reveal long and widened teeth. As it shrieked, the whole head halved in the middle, making it look like a nightmare version of Pac-Man. It had no eyes, only the wide mouth and stretched skin that continued down to the emaciated and sunken chest that now forced itself through the void in Eli's body. My senses finally seemed to recover, while the thing that was still attempting to escape into this world. I picked Jessica up and ran to my truck. No! Ray screamed out while I was attempting to force the frantic Jess into the passenger seat. There has to be two! He yelled as he came running towards us. Behind him, I saw the beast fall to the ground after escaping Eli's body though it lay on the concrete, seemingly exhausted from its transition, it looked to be quite tall. The eerily thin frame was mostly humanoid, but each limb looked twice the length of my own. Its whole body looked like an elongated skeleton with that grayed skin wrapped around the bones. Ray got to the side of my truck and was pulling on the door handle. I would locked it as soon as I got in, but he just kept yanking on it until it broke off in his hand. He screamed out again, and he barely sounded human anymore. He pounded on the window, instantly causing cracks to spiderweb across it. I kicked it into reverse and shot back out of the driveway, leaving my friend to fall to his knees. 
I took one final glance to see the portal disappear and the two halves of Eli fall to the ground. Clearly flesh does not recover as well as brick and mortar with such things. Ray attempted to run after me as I sped away from his house, but even if he hadn't still been wearing the heavy backpack, I had pedal pushed to the floor. Once I was sure that there was enough distance between us, I called 911. I had no idea what to tell them, so I just reported a possible homicide at Ray's address. I didn't stop rolling until my truck was running on fumes. Jessica had been catatonic since she watched her husband quite literally fall to pieces before her eyes, but at least she was alive. I considered driving home, but I was certain Ray would go there first if he was searching for his sister and I. I pulled off the interstate to find gas station and hotels right off the exit. A passenger was still out of it, so I checked us into one of the roadside motels after filling up my gas tank went ahead and just got one room with two beds so I could keep an eye on her through the night. I didn't want to creep her out or make her feel like I was holding her hostage, but my head was still spinning from that evening's events. I still can't believe my friend had gone so far off the deep end. Had this been his plan all along? Had he just been using me to bring whatever the hell that was into this world? Jess just lay in the bed across from me, still shaking all over. I would have to try and get her help soon. Hell, I would have to get myself help for that matter. Her body was faced away from me, so I walked over to where she lay to check on her. She was out, thankfully. I could only hope that rest would help her troubled mind. It was just when I was about to attempt to lay down myself that my phone rang. I was apprehensive at first, unsure if it may be Ray attempting to contact me, but no. Given the bizarre circumstances the police found when they arrived at my friend's house, I would have to make a statement as to the events that took place. The detective told me that they found some video footage at the scene, and I would be required to make a statement. He sounded confident that I wouldn't be facing any charges, but they needed to hear my account of what happened. couldn't help but wish I'd taken the time to locate a payphone before placing the 911 call, but I wasn't exactly thinking straight. I made arrangements to have someone pick up Jessica in the morning, at which point I would make my way to the police station. I was still very uncertain of what to expect, but I knew Jess was going to be in need of some serious psychological care. The investigator was actually far more understanding of my apprehension and concerns than I would have expected. An ambulance arrived at the motel just a couple of hours later. Jessica was still out of it, but the paramedics assured me they would get her the care she needed. After they took off, I headed back toward the city I fled from only a handful of hours before. Having driven for longer than I realized the previous night, it took me a while to arrive at the station back in Ray's neck of the woods. My thoughts were all over the place, but I just wanted this nightmare to be over. Detective Leary was waiting for me in his office when I arrived. He was an older guy, but I think he appeared more aged than he really was. He had thin brown hair that receded back a good bit. He wore a thick mustache and rimless glasses. He spoke in a friendly tone, but his expression appeared quite stern. There were two other individuals in the room when I walked in, but they showed no motivation to introduce themselves. They both wore dark suits and had a similarly cold expression on their faces. They were both maybe mid-thirties. The shorter of the two had a shaved head, while the other sported a blonde buzz cut. Neither of them said a word while they just stood at the back of the room. The detective told me the two men were in charge of the investigation, though he would be the one asking the questions. I knew nothing about any of the room's inhabitants, but Leary came off a little intimidated by the duo in the nice suits. It's very possible he was just one of those particularly skittish people, but 
Given the pictures on the walls of seemingly very important individuals shaking the detective's hands, I had to assume it was just these particular men that made him nervous. At the officer's request, I recounted the events of the previous day along with the details of the project we'd worked on these past few months. It was a grueling conversation, and retelling these facts caused me to physically wince multiple times. I don't think I'd allowed myself to really take in everything that happened until this very moment. By the time I was finished with my story, I found myself just staring at the desk I sat in front of, barely holding on to my own sanity. Nobody said anything after I told my side of things until Leary asked for me to step outside for a moment. I shook my head to snap out of my vacant stare and just nodded to the man before walking out the door. A good 30, 40 minutes passed before I was invited back in. As soon as I strolled through the open door, the two silent men walked quickly past me without so much as glancing in my direction. They seem friendly, I remarked to the detective before the two were out of earshot. You have no idea. He replied. Leary went on to explain that the men in the finely tailored suits were against the idea of me seeing what he wanted to show me. He told me he thought I had the right to view the video footage they'd found. This is going to be tough to watch, and I'm sure you're going to need a truckload of therapy after this, so it's completely your call he said, holding the remote control to the monitor that sat on the other side of his desk. I wasn't quite ready to face the reality of everything that had occurred, but I had to know what happened next. As the video began to play, I wondered when exactly Ray had begun recording. I asked the detective to fast forward through the events I witnessed firsthand and basically cut to the chase. I stared on with wide eyes as the video sped through the horrific act that had been forced on Eli. The poor guy didn't even have a chance. I have no doubt that even if he had denied Ray's question of trust, he would have met the same fate. Leary started playing the tape again and I watched my truck speed away from the house with my friends screaming out after me. The skeletal creature lay on the concrete of the garage while Ray erratically paced back and forth. There has to be two, he was muttering, over and over to himself as he walked from side to side across his lawn. There's no time. No time for more. No time at all. He continued, sounding more maniacal with every word. I just wanted to share. Share with them, but no, no, they wouldn't. No time. There has to be two. No time now. He went on and on, just repeating the same thoughts, each time more hairy than the last. No time, he said somberly, as he came to a halt in front of the graying green thing on the floor. Has to be done. No time left, he remarked one last time before he picked the gun back up off the ground. It had been dragging behind him as he darted back and forth, still wearing the heavy backpack. He stared back into the camera that had apparently been mounting close to the rear of his garage. He didn't say another word. He just raised the gun up slowly and planted the barrel into his own mouth. Since he directed the portal into his throat, I could not see the opening form. He just stood there, his head tilted back while both of his arms dropped to his side and the gun fell back to the ground. For minutes, he just stared motionlessly up at the sky. I audibly gasped when the long, bony fingers reached out of his mouth. They gripped at the sides of his face and forced the opening wider, splitting and tearing the flesh. I fought against the lump forming in my own throat as I looked on while Ray's face was ripped and his skull cracked and splintered. His neck bulged and tore open while sharp twigs of rib bones pierced out of his chest. 
What was left of his head gave way as the thing forced its way out. Chunks of bloody meat and scarlet tissue fell to the ground, each part sounding more moist and sticky than the last. By the time the creature fell to the ground beside the other, which had now only begun to move, my friend was completely split apart from the abdomen up. He stood in place with his hands almost touching the ground, as what remained of his shoulders now hung by his waistline. Leary turned off the tape after that last part, but I still just glared blankly at the screen. He wouldn't give me any insight into the investigation, nor would he tell me if the creatures were still there when the police arrived. I was asked to sign an agreement that I would not speak of this, but I assumed nobody would believe me anyway. I've kept my word until now. It's been about a year since that awful night, and I've been attending regular therapy since. Jess is still in the mental institution, but she finally started speaking again a few months back. I make sure to visit her at least once a week, and she's slowly coming back to herself, though I highly doubt she'll ever be the same as she was before all this madness. I have... No way of knowing whatever happened to the monstrous beings that were birthed through my friends by the way of portal gun that I helped create. I can't speak to the location of said invention either. Whether it's connected or not, I've been receiving calls from Ray's phone the last few days. I finally broke down and answered it last night. I don't know how, but it was my friend's voice on the other end. He sounded different, which is not surprising as his head was fragmented into bony and bloody chunks. Somehow, I believed it was him, though I had no idea how that could even be possible. Two more, it said. Has to be two more. I immediately hung up the phone and threw it to the ground. I stomped the damn thing with the heel of my foot until it was just shattering of plastic and glass. I couldn't be sure of what those words meant, but I'm not sticking around to find out. I'm packing my shit and I'm getting the hell out of Dodge. Hopefully, I can convince Jess to come with me, if I can even get her out of the institution she's in. Either way, I won't wait around to see what happens next. I can't know what my friend's true motivation was behind all this. Just please understand. I would have never let it go this far if I could have known what he intended. He said we would change the world together. I want to give a quick thank you to all of my $5 patrons and members. Absinthe Alice, Alice E, Amethyst, Amet, Caroline, Christina Smith, CT, Deborah Tychus, Elizabeth Watkins, Alice G, Furious Weasel, If and Down Flat Out, Jesse Jess Jess, Justinia Zaromsky, Karen Parrott, Kat, Lee Riggs, Lindsay Pruitt, Melody Evans, Melissa Berwick, Mindy Bannon, Moon Potato, Nicholas Moore, Nikki Parsons, Nova Nocturne, Patricia Rodea, Ray Clegg, Centennial, The New Ongome 24, Tiger Princess, Triumph, and Victoria Step. Thank you all for the continued support, and thank you to everyone who continues watching videos. It's been a really great month, and I can't wait for you all to hear the best of coming out next. And I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your month. Take care, everyone. See you soon.